From Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, and the home of Hot Chicken, it's the Rick Altizer Show. Sit back, buckle up. Rick will talk with the movers, shakers, and creators who put Christ in Christian entertainment. He's a man who's clear so the world can hear. Here's Rick Altizer. Hey, thanks for joining me today. That was Bob Allen, the voice of The Rick Altizer Show. And you're listening to The Rick Altizer Show. Last couple of weeks, you've had Andy Irwin uh, on. And uh, for you guys who've missed that, you can go to my podcast and check that out. And this week, we've got his brother, the other half of the Irwin brother filmmaking duo, uh, John Irwin. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks so much for having me, man. It's uh, it's uh, in touch your expectations low. If I followed Andy, but uh, but what a what an amazing weekend uh, to finally allow people to experience what what we've experienced um, with this song first of all, and then this story. Uh, I can only imagine it's changed all of our lives a little bit, and uh, now my hope is that it'll do the same for the audience. So we're talking about the movie. I can only imagine that is in theaters as we speak. Uh, the uh, release date was uh, the theater date was March sixteenth of uh, 2018 and john is the director john 316 just saying uh, <laughs> how, how cool is that the next time the six uh, the 16th lands on a friday is 2029 so what an amazing uh uh coincidence uh with this film and and uh and you know that's just one of the many miracles that we've experienced as this thing has come to the screen it's just been the most amazing thing i felt like i'm a i've, I've like uh uh guiding a freight train or something it's just this thing's got a will of its own it's, yes. it's incredible to see yes and so for those who have uh who missed the last two shows like i said you can go to my podcast and check that out or my website and listen to uh, what andy talked about but john would you mind just kind of giving us an update for those who might have missed those two shows uh on on what the film is about i can only imagine well yeah i can only imagine is uh of course the best-selling most played christian song of all time and it really is a anthem of hope for so many of us, uh, um, you know, it, 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 for me during a time of loss, you know, and our family was dealing with the, the loss of an extended family member to cancer. Uh, I listened to imagine probably a hundred times in a row, you know, uh, and we just dream about a world without pain and suffering. And, and, uh, you know, I think it's like that for millions of people. In fact, we've been staggered at how many people have, you know, over, uh, over a hundred and, uh, nearly 140 million uh, views of the trailers and, and the behind the scenes clips online, which is exponentially more than anything we've ever been involved with. And in fact, a record for a fate film, um, you know, it's just, it, it blows my mind how many people this song has touched. And yet there's this story behind the song that nobody knows. And I, and I vividly remember talking to Bart uh, Millard, who the lead singer, mercy me, who wrote the song and saying, you know, how do you know God is real? And he said, I know God is real because of the change I saw in my dad. He said, I watched a monster transform into my best friend and the man I wanted to become. And there's just no other explanation for it than God's work in his life. And, uh, and that's very, very special. And so I, I think uh, it's, it's an honor to bring that story to the screen. It's such a relatable uh, story between a father and son. And so we all know, I can only imagine, is this song about heaven. Uh, what we don't know is that uh, Bart is singing it for his dad, and that song was birthed out of this incredible story of redemption and reconciliation between a father and son. I saw the movie last year at ICVM, so that was kind of an early cut of the movie. And then I saw it again a couple weeks ago. I got a screener of when I was interviewing Andy. And uh, just just love the movie. I really recommend people going and seeing the movie. I thought it was I thought it was great personally. Uh, and um, can, can we talk a little bit about we talked about this with Andy some, but can we talk? I like to harp on this. Can we talk about why it's important to go the week the movie opens up and why it's important to go buy a movie ticket? You know what's interesting about that is I can explain it to you in one word, and it's an incredibly powerful word for Christians to be familiar with. It's called FOMO, F-O-M-O. -O. It means the fear of missing out, and it drives culture today. In fact, um, if, you can, uh, uh, if you can make a lot of noise, any group can make – I'll give you an example. There was a movie called Fault in Our Stars, really good little movie. Uh, I did not go see that film because I was a tween fan of John Green's books. Uh, 
but there were so many tween fans of John Green's books that I could not go because I'm a frequent moviegoer and, and I had to see it. And so, cause, uh, so that curiosity, that cultural curiosity is very powerful. And a generation that's slipping away from Christianity can be found at your local theater. It's amazing how closely uh, the statistics are between uh, those kind of abandoning their faith and those that are frequent moviegoers. And, and they're driven by the fear of missing out. So when we go champion something at the same time as one voice, uh, it makes a difference. And, and it's a way that we can get to get our value system uh, to a generation that's slipping away. It's so important uh, that we make some noise together. Uh, and if it's something that you believe in uh, and, and that you uh, – a story that you believe in, uh, you have no idea how much of a difference it makes if you go see it opening weekend, not only in America – but all over the world, F film uh, entertainment is America's second largest export behind agriculture. And there's about 20 movie theaters opening every day in China. And so it's amazing that if you go see it in America, a film that you believe in, uh, it, it goes on autopilot all over the world if it's successful in America. And uh, it's a way to get our value system all over the world. Uh, it's a Trojan horse uh, globally. And so that's why it's important to go see a movie when it opens. Um, uh, it creates noise. It creates the fear of missing out. So, yeah, help me, help me kind of get that, uh, the fear of missing out. Okay, I, I need to go see this movie because it's going to help people who are afraid of missing out to go see it. I mean, help connect that dot for me. Uh, well, yeah, first of all, first of all, go see it because it's an entertaining, you know, movie that will move you emotionally. And I think you'll have a great time in the theater. Um, but what happens with this generation, if, if you want me to really, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but, uh, the current generation, this current, uh, you know, millennials on down, they have about 250 friends on average on, on these kind of various social networking, uh, kind of a bifurcated social network. Uh, you know, the, the moms are getting on Facebook, so the kids are getting off and they're going more to Instagram and Snapchat. And, and yet, uh, the, uh, you know, the number of people that you can count on in a life crisis has been declining since 1951 and the space per person has tripled since 1970. So if you put that cultural portrait together, what you find is a generation that is hyper connected, but really lonely. They live in a large space alone with no one they can really count on. And yet they have this digital window into 250 perfect lives. Uh, and that's the culture that they live in. So out of that, the thing that has been greatly amplified for this generation is the need to belong and the fear of missing out. You see it with Black Panther right now. Black Panther became this cultural conversation, this cultural moment that none of us wanted to miss out on. So we all rushed to the theater. And so, well, Christians can do that very same thing. People of faith and people of values can do that same thing. If we champion something together, uh, we can uh, we can make a lot of noise Um uh, and we can get, get a generation to come to us uh, through curiosity. But it's going to take all of us. And it's going to take all of us doing the same thing at the exact same time, if that makes sense. And, uh, and it's a very powerful motivator today. Uh, popularity is. Uh, and then when you trigger certain box office thresholds, it triggers what's called global output deals, meaning that the movie goes to the world not because of the worldview of the movie, but because of basic arithmetic. Um, America exports what's popular uh, to the world. And if we can trigger those levels of popularity, then, uh, then this message that we care so deeply about goes on global autopilot all over the world in a way the world can't refuse. There's countries that you can't preach Christianity in the open streets, but they can't stop the movies because you tie your movie to the, the mass export from America to Black Panther and all these other films. Uh, and so it's just this incredible opportunity uh, to get our, our worldview out. So it's kind of like you kind of like Tom's, you know, if you buy a pair of shoes, they send a pair of shoes. Well, with a movie, if you if you go see it opening weekend and that movie is successful, you're getting the message of that movie out to the world. And, you know, about 10 people are going to see it all over the world on your behalf that wouldn't have otherwise. That's how it works. You are listening to The Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio, and my guest today is uh, director John Irwin from the uh, directing team of the Irwin Brothers, uh, movies such as Woodlawn, Mom's Night Out, October Baby, and in theaters now, I can only imagine. Uh, you know, uh, John, that's a, that's a really interesting... Uh, I, I've heard many people talk about how movie, how expensive movies are to make, and 
Christian movies especially, and if you want Christian movies to exist, it's important that you go to the theater and buy a ticket because that money gets back to the filmmakers, and especially that opening weekend, it helps with the success of the movie. But putting it in with the fear of missing out and with the culture, I've never really uh, had that discussion before. I, that's really fascinating. Uh, that's com- the opportunity. It's it's an incredible opportunity, and, 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 I, and I love helping educate. And uh, just helping people understand uh, how this all works and why it all works. Um, because when, when you do, you realize, man, this is a incredible opportunity. You know, we have an opportunity to get the gospel out to the world in a way that there has not been this opportunity before. There, there's never been a generation that could say that, you know, like the Great Commission that Jesus talks about is possible in our time. And yet suddenly we find ourselves in a moment where there's more cell phones than people on the earth and people accessing those, you know, those cell phones have, have better access to mobile data in some parts of the world than drinking water. And so this is an incredibly, uh, it's an incredible time to be alive. And, and, and what you have to do uh, is you have to harness the mechanisms. There's always been the message that we care about that's unchanging. The mechanisms change with time. And and this is an incredible mechanism of story. I heard T.D. Jakes say, uh, <laughs> that's pretty funny. He said, uh, uh, Jesus was a storyteller. So if he was, I remember him vividly saying, if he was alive today, he'd be a filmmaker. And I'm like, I don't know if that's true or not, or the theology behind it, but I'll take it. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> but we are. We're, we're, we're storytellers serving the greatest storyteller of all time. And the right story can change your life. And, and that is amazing about how if a movie is successful, uh, just from a dollar standpoint, just mathematically, if, if any movie reaches a certain amount of uh, threshold of dollars, it's going to go further. It's going to go to the world. And it's, yep. you know we're told to go and make disciples of all nations. And what an amazing way that here at this time, uh, the Christian movie industry is starting to do that. I, I've talked about, I'll, my listeners are probably tired of hearing this, I, I say so many times, I'm looking at the Christian movie industry kind of like what the music industry was like in the 80s. Correct. That's when, exactly right. When all the when all the the secular companies started buying up all the Christian companies and they saw that Amy was selling a million records every time she put out a record she would sell a million records so they say hey we you got, got it. we got to get a piece of this and so A&M and all these guys came in and then took Amy to to MTV and took Michael W Smith to MTV and then all of a sudden the Christian bands started sounding like everybody else, and they started getting the top yeah. producers and the top uh, musicians and all the the same guys who're playing with Toto or playing on you know whoever Christian album is you know out and uh, the the level of everything just kind of shot up and I, and I kind of saw this I think kind of started with passion of the Christ, but they're you know obviously the Kendrick brothers have mm-hmm. made a, have made a big impact, and then you guys are, are starting to make an impact on how the the quality level as the the big business is getting involved. The quality level of filmmaking, Christian filmmaking, is 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 the bar is starting to be raised. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of raising that bar and what you guys are doing? You know, to I, you know, I've obviously had this conversation with Andy, but I'd love to hear your take on that. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because we we really want to. That's our goal. Is I remember uh, <laughs> on the set of Woodlawn. Uh, Sean asked and said, I see you guys as frontiersmen and pioneers. And I said, thanks, Sean. That's our, that's our aim, you know, and, uh, we want to blaze a trail. And he said, you know, John, most frontiersmen die on the trip, <laughs> die out on the trail. And I'm like, I never really thought about that, but there will be a clearly marked trail and, uh, we'll be frozen pointing to the summit or something like that. And let me tell you what the summit of this mountain is. Uh, it's a movie infused with the gospel. Uh, serving, as Dennis Quaid says, the underserved audience, uh, uh, you know, as, as Christians, competing with Star Wars. There's enough of us. We could do that. I don't know what role Andy and I uh, will play in that and how far up the mountain we'll be able to go. But I'm telling you, that's possible. There's nothing mathematically stopping the church except the way we view ourselves. In many ways, we're like that elephant, you know, the, the circus elephant that, you know, when they train a young elephant, they, they tie him to a post with a, with a chain that keeps him there. And then when he's an adult, that elephant can be held by that post by like a piece of string or like a small rope that he could yank free easily, except that he has this improper view of himself and his own strength. That's the way the church is. There are so many of us and we have such incredible resources um, because some of the families within Christianity that have been so successful that are a part of this film, by the way, um, we have only begun to see what we could do culturally. And I just pray 
that Christians could get a vision of offense instead of defense. And what I mean by that is Jesus said on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay, a gate is not a weapon. Nobody's going to throw a gate at you. Uh, gates are meant to be stormed and we're meant to, we're meant to play offense culturally and we're meant to take the gospel to places uh, like movie theaters. And it's so inspiring to me that this generation leaving the church is an almost dead-on statistical match to frequent moviegoers. There they are. Let's take the gospel to them there. The way we get to them is, uh, is unity and have a unified vision and to make a lot of noise at the same time. And we're asking everyone to do that uh, by going and seeing I Can Only Imagine. Uh, the cool thing about the opportunity, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned music, you know, uh, Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith, who, are, who you mentioned and are represented, uh, in the film because of Amy's incredible selfless decision to help launch I Can Only Imagine that nobody knows. I'm glad they'll know it now. Um, you know, if you think about what Christian music was like, um, uh, it, it, there was a lot of uniformity to it. It was just kind of one thing. And what I love that happened with Christian music is the quality went way up, and so did, so did the diversity. And it really became like a tree that grew out into these very unique branches. So you have all these different genres of Christian music today, but they all do the same thing. They all edify and inspire us and draw us closer to our faith. Okay, so I'm hoping for the same thing with movies. I'm hoping we can get the quality up and we can make these films better and better so that they can be seen by more and more people. And then I'm hoping an incredible amount of diversity could hit the space as young voices and up-and-coming filmmakers can have a platform where their voice can be heard. And we can branch out and have different kinds of movies uh, that maybe are different genres of film, but that serve the same purpose, which is to tell God's story on film. And, uh, and that's what Andy and I hope to do. And we hope to be some of the original pioneers in that. There's only about a dozen of us, uh, doing this stuff. I was very inspired by a recent documentary on Steven Spielberg. And it just talked about, there was this group of filmmakers. It was Spielberg and Lucas and the, uh, the Palma and Coppola, you know, and Scorsese. And they were all fiercely competitive trying to one up each other, but they were also incredibly supportive to each other's work. And, and, uh, that's happening. There's just a few of us doing this stuff. And, uh, and I hope that we can blaze a trail and create an opportunity for that next generation. You know, this show you're listening, by the way, you're listening to the Rick Altizer show on bot radio. My guest today, a film director, John Irwin from the, uh, directing team of the Irwin brothers had his brother Andy on the last two weeks. And we're talking about the movie. I can only imagine in theaters now. Um, and we would love it if you went and saw that. Uh, I think it's a great movie, and I encourage that. Uh, so, but on the show, John, we, you know, we kind of go a little, it's, it's, I interview media makers. Uh, you know, I've had the Kendrick brothers on, and we talk about kind of the process a little bit. But so this is really interesting that you're talking about modeling uh, the, 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 the music industry. And so what happened in the 80s and in the 90s is that, you had kind of the secularization of Christian music, and people started substituting the word Jesus, and they would say love, you know, uh, for, for Jesus, and oh, you, we all need love, and, and you know, you could be singing about Buddha, really, there was nothing inherently Christian about a lot of it. And yeah, and exactly. where the and, and, and so the, the industry kind of, well, too, with all the music industry, it kind of went away and all you're looking at now is just completely Christ-centered worship music is pretty much at Correct. the forefront of all music and uh those songs that were singing about love or whatever uh, even even the 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 songs that you had like say like with a Keith Green very prophetic kind of in your face challenging you that kind of has gone away and it's all just Correct. worship music and so uh, I had this with uh, conversation with Bill Reeves. He was on the show, and he was talking about how Christian audiences don't want to be offended when they go to a movie. And that, Correct. On the, so on the one hand, you can't you know have drugs and cussing and that kind of stuff. And then I've noticed when you take the Jesus out, I think people can spot a fake. Christian market can spot a fake a mile away, and they go, this is just Hollywood trying to make a buck, or this is people watering down Correct. the message. And those movies tend to, tend to tank. You look at the big movies, they've got a very strong Christ-centered message. So can we talk about that, navigating how the, the Christian music industry kind of you know, tried to reach out to more people and how it ended up just becoming very insular 
where it is yeah. right now and, and what you want to see films go cuz cuz really you guys are at the 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 baby stage but I think you can learn a lot by looking at the music industry and seeing some of the things they did that maybe you don't want to do. Yeah, you know, that's interesting that you pointed uh uh that out and you even see that with a movie like Wrinkle in Time um that didn't really stay true to the source material and I think offended the fans. Um I think that there was a a belief that I think was sort of a lie um way back when that um that uh you know to reach a broad audience you had to dumb down the message you know and uh that's not true uh you know I think that there was a lie that if you wanted to make an overt Christian film it had to be a low budget and maybe a little cheesy or something like that and then if you wanted to make a broad film, it, you had to kind of take the message out completely. I think people just respect a message that is authentic and bold. And, um, you know, people love what other people are passionate about, I think. And, and, and I think we need to be as overt with that as possible. But I think there's a way to do it that is, in, that is inviting and unifying. Um, you know, that, that um, there's a way to showcase our values. Um, you know, in a way that they're universally appealing. But we're talking we're this. talking to a culture, okay, and, and we all have this enmity with God that yeah. that hates God. That hates the fact that God is saying, This is sin. I define who you are. We're we're in this self culture of self where we're self defining. And so we hate the fact that God is telling me who I am and how how I need to live. So how do you navigate that? Well, yeah, there's that. And then there's also, you know, there's that war inside all of us. There's a side of us, yeah, that hates the truth. There's also a side of us that craves the truth, you know, and Jesus mm-hmm. said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw them into myself, you know, and, and there's that, there's, there's that God shaped hole inside all of us. And there's a yearning for what's true and what's real. And, uh, no matter who you are. And I think that there's a generation waking up to the lies that my industry tells them that, um, that, you know, success and happiness comes through, you know, wealth and, and, you know, fame and beauty. And I, I think it's like Jim Carrey said, um, uh, I wish everyone could be rich and famous and have everything they've ever wanted to know. It's just, it's not the answer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, I think, so I think there's both. I think that there's, there's animosity, but there's also incredible cultural hunger uh, for these messages, uh, especially this message of hope and redemption and reconciliation and forgiveness. And I think when we present them correctly and put them out there, God can do the rest. It, and uh, and it's exciting to see people uh, that, that have no faith at all respond so deeply to the material. And I, I saw that. You know, I mean, I, we just watched a documentary on Billy Graham last night. And you know, he just had this message of Christ. It was so Christ-centered, but it was always God loves you. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you are, God loves you. And relationship, I think you're talking about this generation that is lonely, that is is searching for relationship, and that comes across so strong in this movie, this relationship between this father and how you know, we all crave that father love. And and this this guy that Bart himself said was a monster who became his best friend. What a, and it was just a beautiful story of redemption, a beautiful story of transformation, and what God's love can do. And I think that's kind of the message that that to me I think is the important message as Christian filmmakers we need to keep saying is this message of God loves you, God can redeem you, He can heal you, He can heal your relationships. And man, you, you know it. Uh, Show don't tell. I, I did the Shonda Pierce movies, and uh, I directed those, and that were in theaters. Oh, cool! And, How about and, uh, that? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't. You know, whatever. But but you know, our whole thing was show don't tell. You know, correct. We, we don't want to have to preach it. We just want to show it and, and and let let it do its thing. And, and the movie really does communicate the power of the gospel. But you're not preaching the gospel. You're just showing the the reality of it. And so uh, I love what you're doing there. I love how you're doing it. And uh, yes, John, we need more people doing that and uh, making that kind of making that kind of movie. And thank you so well, much thank, for doing it. Thanks so much. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we fall in love with is a true story. You just can't argue with the truth. We really, I heard somebody say, a filmmaker finds his voice, finds his story, and just tells it over and over again. In this case, um, 
you know, true stories uh, are just something that we've fallen in love with, with, uh, um, you know, with, uh, with well, Woodlawn. Woodlawn, with, with, yeah. With, and, and we American talked about Icon, how that was based also, on your... We talked about how it was based yeah. on your dad, and uh, we talked about that with Andy. So go check that out. We're we're out of time. See, I told you, we're out of time. It went I so enjoyed quick. This conversation, man, it felt like five minutes. Well, until next time. Well, you know, thank you. Uh, we love Bot Radio, and uh, God bless you guys. And we'll see you at the theater for I can only imagine. I can't wait for people to experience this film. Yes, thanks, thanks, John. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye bye. If there's a show you've missed, you can go to my website, rickaltizer.com, and catch up. Or you can listen to my podcast in iTunes or wherever you hear your podcasts. Just search for The Rick Altizer Show. Altizer is spelled A-L-T-I-Z-E-R. I want to thank you for listening. Hey, would you tell a friend about this show and share the love? Be sure to check us out again next week as we discuss how we communicate the gospel through media to our culture. Let's be clear so the world can hear. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening.